Welcome to Telling the Truth 2020 at the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany, State University of New York. I'm Mark Koplik, Assistant Director. A virtual symposium on politics, journalism, tribalism, polarization, and the future of democracy, Telling the Truth 2020 brings you conversations with major thinkers and public figures from across the political spectrum. We're grateful to be here today with two leading intellectuals who represent a free market center-right perspective. Alison Schrager is a financial economist and expert on the concept of risk. She's the author of An Economist Walks Into a Brothel, an entertaining examination of the nature of risk in a variety of unexpected settings, including legal prostitution in the Nevada desert, the cutthroat profession of the paparazzi in pursuit of celebrity photos, and the dangerous lives of big wave surfers. More importantly, she applies the tested lessons of financial risk to everyday decision making. It's such a fun book, and it affirms what an adventure intellectual inquiry can be. It may even make you want to become an economist. Alison Schrager is senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor of City Journal, and co-founder of the risk advisory firm Lifecycle Life Finance Partners. Economist Michael Strain is director of economic policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute and a Bloomberg opinion columnist. He also appears regularly on NPR's Marketplace, MSNBC, and CNBC. The National Review named Strain the most important conservative reformer, and David Brooks of the New York Times has called his work the most coherent and compelling policy agenda the American right has produced this century. He's the author of the 2020 book, The American Dream is Not Dead, But Populism Could Kill It, which presents the argument that there has never been a better time to be alive in America. The book will remind many of our audience members of the work of Steven Pinker, who visited us recently in person, it's a compelling evidence-based argument for being optimistic about America. It all, has also received some notable words of admiration from folks on the left side of the political divide. You can find out a lot more about both our guests and both books here on this page. You can also purchase the books via a link to an independent bookstore right here on your screen. Allison and Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. With, with all of the turmoil surrounding the election and the terrible political polarization in this country, it feels peculiar to be talking about optimism. In, in this moment, why should we be optimistic? Would you like me to begin? Sure. Um, I think there there is a lot of reason for optimism. I mean, you know, uh, uh, certainly things are are very bad right now. Uh, the you know pressing challenges, of course, the coronavirus pandemic that has claimed a quarter of a million lives, and uh, and that we and that we haven't seen the uh, the worst of yet. Um, at least if you listen to some of the public health experts. Uh, in terms of daily caseloads or hospitalization rates, um, December, January, uh, uh, February really could be could be the 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 worst of this, um, and that's terrible. We have a bad, we have a very weak economy right now. Uh, we have recession level unemployment. We have a major contraction in economic output. Uh, we have an increase in in uh, material hardship. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of people are really suffering. Uh, you know, dur when we're at the time of this conversation, we don't know who the president is going to be, um, and uh, you know that's you know obviously uh, a challenge as well. Um, but if you if you look, I think as I do in my in my book, at the last several decades, what you see is a story of typical workers and typical households overcoming these sorts of challenges. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at, at, at how uh, typical workers and typical households have fared, um, they, they have fared you know, reasonably well 
despite major setbacks like recessions. Um, and so, you know, the historical record suggests that American workers and American households are going to overcome the, the, current, the current challenge. Um, and that is a, a reason to be, to be hopeful and optimistic. So, uh, Allison, you, you say at one point that, uh, you know, from a risk perspective, there's been no better time to be alive. Did, does that apply to this moment as well? Or? It does. And I think this just shows how, how much risk we, we are used to living with. I mean, sort of deadly diseases taking people out, usually much younger than even this one is frequently, like, we used to be a fact of life. And I think the fact that we've been able to put our economy through so much angst, like such a big slowdown to save life shows how much richer we are, how much more like valuing the life, life the way we do is, is such a luxury that previous generations never had. I mean, if you think about how COVID might have been sort of addressed or dealt with, you know, 100 years ago, people were just used to these sorts of things because they tolerated, because they didn't really have a choice, people dying quite young and infectious diseases being rampant. Now, I mean, this is just so foreign to us that we're willing to really almost like really go through a very deep recession to save a lot of lives, particularly elderly lives mostly. And I think that's incredible. I think it just shows uh, how far we've come and this is a civilization really where we can value life like no other. As economists, what, why do you think we have a problem with tribalism? Is, is it because we feel that we and people like us are uh, all competing for a, a smaller and smaller slice of the pie, or is it something else? You mean economists or like the whole world? Well, I, I meant you as economists. Well, 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 what, why, why do you feel that uh, tribalism is a problem? Is there an economic perspective on that? Well, actually, weirdly, the election makes me feel better about polarization because so many people split their ballot. I mean, isn't that amazing that maybe we see a lot of polarization and tribalism on Twitter where I spend all my time? Um, <laughs> maybe the average American is able to just look at things and say, not that guy, but that guy. And I don't care what party he's a part of. Michael, did you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think tribalism is a is a is a you know, look, I mean, tribalism is a, is a mixed bag. Uh, there are there are certainly good things uh, that are associated with identifying as a member of a tribe and being loyal to that tribe and taking and taking the tribes um, uh, taking you know the tribe's views into account and govern and you know and allowing them to really shape your own views. Um, you know, so I think I think there's a sense in which tribalism gets a bad rap, um, uh, but. You know, excessive amounts of tribalism, um, you know, can can lead into unhealthy territory uh, where people are living in kind of fundamentally different worlds. Uh, people are consuming information from different sources. Those sources are 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 reporting very different information, uh, uh, and 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 and. Uh, excessive tribalism can kind of chip away at um, a unified national narrative, a unified cultural experience, a unified understanding of, of society and of, and of, and of the, the circumstances in which we live. Um, and so it's a question, I think, of, of, just, of just getting the balance right. I think we've, we've been, you know, out of whack for, for a while now. I agree with Allison that um, it's kind of remarkable to see Republicans pick up seats in the Senate, uh, you know, while the while the while well, you know, all all signs point to President Trump losing uh, losing the election. Um, uh, you know, in terms of whether tribalism, you know, has a direct effect on on the economy, I would say it's 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 secondary. You know, we are we are starting to see. I mean, you know, one of the things to keep an eye on is. Um, this kind of, you know, I don't know what you call it, woke capitalism or something like that. Uh, uh, you know, that, you know, could be, could be a, a situation where some of the some of the tribalism we've seen, you know, starts to spill over into economic life in a way that's not productive. Um, I, you know, it remains to be seen whether that whether that phenomenon continues, but but it might. Yeah, that's actually what is a good point because I think that's what concerns me most about this 
move to talk about more stakeholder models rather than sh traditional shareholder value. I mean, it's debatable if anyone ever followed the shareholder value model, which was where corporations allegedly their main objective was to maximize profits for shareholders. And now there's this big push. This is a big bugaboo of Joe Biden that uh, we need to think about the whole society and the country when a company makes decisions. And I think that inherently gets political because then you're making a lot of value judgments about who, whose needs matter. And it just, I think it opens the door to make companies a lot more political and a lot more tribal. And I, I think I, I generally am optimistic, but that does worry me because I think a move to that, you said once companies become more political, they also become more polarized. Like a very small example of this would be like Penzi's Spices, which is explicitly very liberal versus I think his estranged sister has a spice company that's very conservative. And not only are customers shopping for different ones, but I imagine they also have different employees. And I think the workplace has always filled an important function of having Americans come together and meeting people with different values, different political persuasions, and learning they're not bad people and actually having to cooperate with them. So in, in 2015, President Obama named you Albany one of the five engines of social mobility in the nation. We rate very highly in national rankings for promoting mobility. About one third of our students are the first in their families to attend college. More than 40% receive federal Pell Grants for exceptional financial need. What would you want to say to our students about the American dream? And I'll go to Michael for that. Uh, that, that the American dream is alive and well. Um, you know, I, I, I think that we have been in the grip of this populist moment. President Trump is a populist. Uh, you know, Vice President Biden is not, um, but Bernie Sanders certainly is. Elizabeth Warren certainly is. Um, and a narrative has developed, which is that the economy is rigged against regular, typical people in favor of the elites, that hard work doesn't pay off, that people's economic outcomes haven't improved, uh, that people are victims either of the elites or of China or of immigrants or of Wall Street or of, 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 of whoever, uh, and that people don't have agency and can't really better their circumstances. And that narrative, which again, you know, some of the most prominent uh, political elected leaders on in the Democratic Party, some of the most prominent political elected leaders in the Republican Party just directly say these things. Not only them, business leaders, uh, uh, opinion leaders, um, uh, 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 economists, you know, re repeat this, uh, this, uh, this, this view as well. And I think that view is is wrong as a, as a matter of, of, of just the, the evidence. And, that, and that's something I go through in my, in my book. Um, but the, that narrative is also, I think, damaging. Uh, if you are a 20 year old or 22 year old and you're hearing this, um, you know, what does that say to you? You know, you're not one of the elites. It says that the economy is rigged against you. It says that hard work won't pay off for you. It says that you should expect that your economic outcomes will will not be will not improve as you as you go through your career. That hard work won't pay off, um, and and I think that that is exactly the opposite message we should be we should be telling young people. Young people should be aspiring. Uh, young people should be working hard. Young people should have confidence that if they do aspire and they do work hard, that they'll be rewarded. That's not just a nice thing to say. I think the I think the evidence for how the economy has performed uh, actually suggests that that's the correct way to look at it. Um, and if young people don't think that, then a you know then 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 uh, uh, bad outcomes will happen as a consequence of that, right? So if you if you don't think that hard work pays off, then you're not going to work as hard, and then and then your outcomes really aren't going to improve. So uh, there's a sense in which this narrative can become self-fulfilling in a way that could be really damaging uh, to young people. Allison, you, you argue that risk is the key to mobility. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering, how, how can we teach young people and college students to value and embrace risk? 
Well, I think, you know, students one have to be comfortable with the idea that sometimes when you take risks, it's not going to go well and you're going to feel bad and that's okay. Um, actually, it was uh, a, a sort of real life changing moment for me I had in the brothel um, when <laughs> I initially went there um, to learn negotiation skills because it turns out they have a negotiation training program and asking for more always made me feel nervous. Um, and I was always a bad at, at negotiating salaries. So I go to this two week negotiation training in a brothel and I was talking to who, who he's since died, the pimp who owned it, Dennis Hoff about, you know, I, I, I like all these women ask for so much money and then they are told no. And then like, what happens? Like they then like have this like crazy sexual encounter. Like, isn't this awkward? And he was like, no, you have to hear no regularly. Otherwise you're not asking for enough. And I, I realized like, I still hate hearing no from people. It still fills me with same anxiety, but I now just sort of sit with it and I'm like, it's okay. It means I asked for enough. I took a risk and you have to take risks for things to move forward. And you have to learn that, okay, if you feel bad and you have some little level of failure, that's okay. Cause it means you tried. And you know what, nine times out of 10, maybe it will work or maybe even 30% of the time it will work, but that's how you move your life forward. And something that I think personally what's wrong with a lot of millennials who are feeling dissatisfied, isn't that the game was stacked against them and they had all this student debt. It was that they didn't really take meaningful risks in their lives. And if you don't take risks, you never really realize your potential. You're sort of robbed of a lot of dignity. And I think they feel like there's this untapped potential in them because you know there's evidence that they don't change jobs as much, that they don't move as frequently. You know, all these things that we associate with risks, entrepreneurship is way down for this. I mean, unless you're of a very small elite minority, odds are you're not starting your own business. And I suspect that might be why there's so much dissatisfaction is there was a lot of untapped risk potential in this population. Uh, for both of you, what, what do you think about the value of a traditional four-year liberal arts education? Does it promote flexible and creative thinking that'll help students face an unpredictable future? Or would you scrap it in favor of vocational training in emerging fields and, and technologies? We'll go to Michael first. Um, you know, I mean, I, th I think the evidence is, 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 is crystal clear that, uh, that a four-year degree has an enormous economic return. Uh, and if people have the aptitude and the interest, then I would encourage them to do that. Um, you know, of course, you don't want people, you know, who uh, uh, don't have the aptitude or the interest to enroll in a program like that because there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, a risk um, to uh, to use Allison's to use Allison's uh, 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 favorite word, there's a there, there's a risk that, that they'll drop out, and that's where you see um, that's where you really see the, the the kind of problem of student debt is not a problem of people who get a four year degree, graduate, and enter in the workforce. The problem is people who uh, who drop out don't get a degree, don't get the economic benefit of that degree, but do have a year or two of, of student loans uh, from, from the year or two they spent in college. Um, you know, I think people should, I think, I, think, I think as a culture, we could do a better job, of course, of talking about vocational education and, and making vocational education something that, that people feel like is a real, a real path for them. And it would be a better choice for a lot of people a better choice than just enter, than entering the labor market with just a high school diploma. Also a better choice than uh, going to college for two years and dropping out and then, and then getting a job. So I do think uh, that, that, that vocational education should be more used than it is. Um, and I think it's a great option for, for a lot of people, but, but I don't think we should be so enthusiastic about vocational education that we, that we are uh, you know, unclear about the, uh, the 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 evidence uh, uh, about the returns to a traditional four year degree, which are which are considerable. And Allison, uh, the same question, but uh, specifically with with the value of say the humanities or the social sciences. Um, you in your book, you, you talk about H. R. McMaster and his pursuit of a of a history degree. And I, I'm just wondering, that, does this have real value for for students? Yeah, I think the way to think about it is, you know, it's not for everyone, but as, as Michael pointed out, people who complete four-year degrees absolutely have higher earnings. Um, it does pay off if you can finish it. 
I think whether or not you do a four-year degree or whether or not you choose a vocational route, you really have to think about skill development throughout the course of your life. And I think the benefit of a four-year humanities degree is it teaches you how to think critical thinking skills, reasoning skills, which help you reskill throughout your lifetime. But even if you do go the vocational route, it's not like you, you, know, you take a course in plumbing and you're done. Like plumbing and construction has also become a lot more technological and also requires constant reskilling. So, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan. Again, if you look at the data, if you finish college, it's definitely useful and it's good to know how to be a thinker. But no matter what you do, you can't think your education is done. You've got to look at both whether you choose vocational, whether or not you choose a four-year degree is giving you a foundation of how you're going to think about learning and reskilling your whole life. So there's a lot of opposition to uh, immigration from some folks in this country. M many of our students are first and second generation immigrants. We, we count about 90 nationalities and 100 languages on campus. What's your message if you have one for young people who are immigrants and the children of immigrants? Um, so going to Michael first. Uh, my message to them in, uh, in, in what sense? Uh, well, I'm, you know, with, with regard to the American dream and, uh, and the, the, the role of immigration in the American dream and, and in the economic vitality of the country. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you know, broadly speaking, I think that the uh, the public conversation around uh, immigration has been appalling over the last uh, four or five years, um, to the point that it, it, at times it's, it's it's actually you know morally outrageous. There is a there is a, a reasonable debate to be had about what types of immigrants the United States should choose to admit. You know, do we want to focus less on on family uh, based immigration and more on skills based immigration? Um, what is the appropriate number of green cards for the United States to issue every year? These are these are very reasonable policy questions on on which reasonable people can disagree. Uh, but I think that the uh, the the problem we've seen is that um, some elements on the political right, including President Trump, so very prominent elements, uh, have taken to demonizing immigrants um, and have taken to uh, uh, you know, presenting a general posture toward immigration, uh, which is that, you know, which is unwelcoming. And that I think has enormous economic uh, uh, ramifications if it continues. Um, the United States has benefited tremendously in an economic sense uh, from being the magnet for some of the world's best and brightest and most ambitious and hardest working and most risk-loving uh, people. Um, and the contributions that immigrants have made to the United States in an economic sense are enormous. Immigrants are much more likely to start businesses than native-born Americans. New businesses uh, create a disproportionate number of new jobs in the economy, bring uh, uh, new products to market, create new opportunities for Americans. Of course, you know, in, 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 in a very real sense, uh, all Americans are immigrants, um, except, for, except for indigenous uh, uh, people, uh, the indigenous people who, who, were, who were living in North America before as uh, settlers arrived from, from Europe. That's of course, is a small share of the, of the population. Uh, and so you would think that in the United States, particularly, this would be, uh, this would kind of go without, go without saying. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think that, 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 that the, the message should be, you are welcome here. You are valued here. Uh, you have a lot to contribute, you have chosen the right country, and if you work hard and apply yourself, uh, you will succeed. And your, and your decision to come to America will be a decision that, that pays off. Um, it, you know, and I hope we get back to that. So turning now to uh, Allison, uh, but, but a question for both of you. At UAlbany, we're one of the most diverse 
tier one public research universities in the country, approximately 50% of our students are people of color. Uh, in your view, should we value diversity and, and does diversity have an economic value? Um, yeah, I think for sure. I mean, you, you definitely gain from hearing people who have different experiences than you, who have different perspectives. Um, I think, you know, as a, as a sole goal, you know, it, it's more limiting if, you know, someone has value just because they bring diversity. I think, you know, th that's not good for anyone, including that, that diversity person. Um, but yeah, and in particularly in an education context where everyone's learning and everyone's sort of exploring new ideas, I think it definitely makes for richer experiences and people learn more. Michael? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I agree with that. I mean, I think, uh, I think that um, that uh, you know that that, that 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 the diversity of experiences uh, is important in 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 an educational setting. I think a diversity of views is also important, um, and you know there is a real issue there on on college campuses as well. There are you know much you know many fewer uh, conservative voices uh, or, or voices that are. That are uh, on on the right half of the political spectrum, uh, and that's something that that uh, that I that I hope universities pay attention to as well. You, you both engage actively and to an admirable degree with people who disagree with you, Allison. You were just on a panel with Robert Reich and Lawrence Summers, and Michael. You take the extraordinary step of incorporating two critiques of your book, one by liberal commentator E.J. Dion and one by conservative commentator, Henry Olson, as well as your rebuttals of those critiques into the pages of your book. What's the importance of engaging with those who disagree with us? Well, that's how you learn. I mean, you're never really gonna have your idea. Your ideas become so much sharper. My, my favorite conversations in the world or my favorite arguments in the world are ones I lose and because I learned something. If, if I can't rebut an argument, then it means I was wrong and maybe, or I hadn't thought about things in a particular way. And as someone who I, I think of myself really as an economist and an, always a lifelong scholar, like it's the most exciting conversations for me in the world are where I learn. And also, I mean, they also need to understand your point of view. I mean, as a center right thinker, you know, you're gonna be challenged a lot, particularly if you engage with the public, especially if you work in media, because everyone is gonna be way to the left of you. So, I mean, I, you know, the idea that I'm gonna deal with people who have different views than me. I live in Manhattan. All my friends are very liberal journalists. I, you know, I, I have no shortage of people who don't think like me. In fact, I have very few people who do in my life. But I find I also, I also provide a great service for them because I, you know, they get a different perspective and they can understand, no, you know, people who think like me aren't just like crazy people who, who have no education. There are different ways to look at things. I think the key is to, you know, never be defensive. As I said, because I'm really open. I love the idea that I'm going to get proven wrong. Um, to he really sort of have let people really explain their views and to ask questions rather than just tell them they're wrong. Usually, I find if they are wrong, the best way to get to that quickly is to just ask them a lot of questions and have them articulate their view better. And if they can't do that, then it wasn't a very good argument. And if they can, you learn something. You want to talk about that, Michael? I agree. look. I agree with all that. I mean, I think I think that you know I you know I'm a I'm a believer in, in, in markets and I, and I think that the, the, that markets are uh, a good way to uh, organize society and allocate resources and, and you know, an important commodity uh, is ideas. And a, a robust marketplace and ideas where there's competition between ideas is going to surface the best ideas uh, for, for the reasons Allison said that uh, that those ideas get tested. Uh, you know, I could talk to people who agree with me all day long, and I'll walk away with a with a um, with a good uh, uh, you know a good sense um, that I am uh, uh, right and terrific. <laughs> but you know, how does that how does that actually actually help me? And more importantly, how does that how does that advance ideas? Uh, you know the the reason that I that I do uh, the, the work I do is is not you know just to entertain myself. It's because I actually want to to try and further 
our understanding of the economy, further our understanding of public policies. Um, and I and I want to I want to to advance my own ideas. Um, and 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 uh, uh, you know if 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 my ideas are bad or my understanding is wrong, it's better I figure that out sooner rather than later. Um, and and the only way to figure that out is to talk to people who 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 don't who don't agree with me. Uh, so you know I think I think it's critically important. Uh, for my own work, I think it's critically important for the, the public square uh, more broadly. I think it's critically important for society as a whole. And I think one of the one of the things that we're we're really losing as a culture is is that understanding of debate and of disagreement. Uh, you know, the last thing I want to do is shut down voices who don't agree with me. I want to hear from voices who don't agree with me. And I want them to hear from me. Um, and and if we if we lose that uh, that 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 cultural understanding of the importance of, of debate, uh, then you know we're gonna we're gonna lose a lot um, because ideas won't get tested, new ideas won't get surfaced, and it's just so much harder to make progress on real problems if if that kind of debate isn't happening. In this age of uh, information overload and social media and the uh, kind of unchecked spread of, of rumors and lies, um, we at, at the university, we encourage our students to question their sources of information. What sources of information do you value and what advice do you have for students as they seek reliable sources of information? Well, it's embarrassing how much information I get off Twitter, which is not, I guess, I could have a free marketplace for ideas. And I guess the, the best ones I Very like free. Went, went out. Yeah, but you, you hear, I find I quote information from Twitter way too much, which might mean it's incredible. Um, but really when I, I feel like what I'm really grounded in what I know, and it might be the economist in me is I seek out data from original sources a lot. Like I spend a lot of time um, looking at data. Uh, certainly through COVID, I'm obsessed with COVID numbers. I think th that always gives me a sense of what's happening because I don't more than hearing from someone else's interpretation. And even when it comes to the economy, you know, I just keep a lot of data sets around and just I'm always running CPS and survey consumer finances whenever someone says something in a New York Times op-ed just to see if that's true. Um, so data, I guess, is sort of where I go. Otherwise, I actually really also do seek out a diversity of opinion. Um, I very rarely watch cable news, but I do read a lot of very left-wing publications, and a lot of very right-wing ones. And I guess from there, I hope there's something, some gradient of truth somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, uh, uh, I get most of my uh, information. So I, so, I, <laughs> so I try to avoid getting information from Twitter. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, like, you know, like, like, uh, you know, similar to what Allison said and, and similar to, I think everybody, um, I am kind of paralyzed by information overload. Uh, and that has actually led me to, uh, kind of return to more traditional sources of media. Um, you know, the nice thing about the morning edition of the Washington Post is that, Professional journalists have curated the previous day's events <laughs> and decided, you know, what should be, you know, what should be most important, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I do a lot of newspaper reading. Um, I read, I, I, I try to read left wing uh, or left leaning sources, I should say, um, uh, for opinions and for and for analysis. But in terms of for kind of straight news, you know, I read Bloomberg, I read the Financial Times, I read. The Washington Post. I read the New York Times. Um, uh, I try to, you know, when 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 analyzing opinion and when when reading opinion and analysis, I try really hard to read things that I that I, that I don't agree with, um, uh, and I and I try to read individual uh, uh, writers and scholars who I who I know I'm not going to agree with. I do a lot of that, um, uh, you know. So I you know I try to read Paul Krugman regularly, for example, even though I know I'm going to disagree with, with everything he says. Um, 
uh, and then I, you know, and I consume a lot of research. Uh, and you know, one of the one of the um, one of the ways I determine what I'm going to read is by determining what I'm what I'm going to write. Uh, and um, you know, if I want to if I if I want to write on a particular topic, then I read a lot about that topic. Um, and uh, you know, I try to read research. I try to read uh, commentary. Um, and, and so that, you know, so, 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 so that ends up, that ends up, uh, uh, helping as well. We're coming up on Thanksgiving, uh, the holiday, uh, and some, some of us will be celebrating it with, with family on Zoom or, or in person, of course. Um, the, the holiday is a collective expression of, of gratitude for all that we have in America. It transcends American divisions. It transcends political disagreements, even within families. Is Thanksgiving in any way a model for a kind of shared gratitude that can keep us, can make us come closer together, keep us from hating each other, that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I love that it's such a uniquely American holiday that we have something that's totally non, that's totally secular and just, you know, really about taking stock and being grateful. Because I think people definitely realize now especially how much they should be grateful for if they have, if they're healthy and, um, you know, ha, you know, it's in such an uncertain times that they do have family they can see. Michael? We're going to talk about how um, Thanksgiving was a holiday imposed by the government forcing us to be grateful um, by a president who suspended habeas corpus and uh, other fundamental constitutional rights and that we should all rebel. That's not what you did, though. No, it's not what I did. Well, you're free to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, not, it's not, you know, it, this isn't China. Like, we, you know, if you, if you want to blow it off, you know, and, and, and feel resentful of what you don't have, you are free to do that. My big problem with Thanksgiving is that it artificially truncates the Christmas season, mm -hmm. to, be, to, to, be, to be more honest about it. If you go over to the UK or, or other European countries, they are in they are in, in glorious full on Christmas season mode in the end of at the end of November and here in America. They, I never, you know, what's strange is I guess globalism. They now do Black Friday in the UK. They do Black Friday, but they don't do Thanksgiving. It's hilarious. Yeah, so uh, They're starting to do Halloween, which is which is. Is, which is which is hilarious. Yeah, they, they picked up Halloween as well. So, um, and I found like, I don't know, I, I lived in the UK for, I went to college there, that we did a lot of Thanksgiving. It wasn't like a holiday, but like I went to a lot of Thanksgiving dinner parties. Like British people, you know, Europeans, like there's an excuse to get together, have a meal and drink, they'll do it. <laughs> so it's not an official holiday. They said they seem to have picked it up anyway, because now they have Black Friday, which really is the start of the Christmas season and uh, are never shy about getting together and eating anyhow. Allison, you're, you're driven by curiosity and it's, it's taken you to some very interesting places. Um, is, is there anything you'd like to say to young people about the value of curiosity? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm someone who always just wants to learn. And um, I tend to be, I guess, open-minded about where I'm gonna learn something and I'll go anywhere where I can learn something. I said, I, I went to a brothel for like weeks to learn how to negotiate. And I, I say, I, I learned a lot, um, uh, not about negotiation, but a, a lot of things, but I don't know what I, what I love. I've spent spells as a journalist, which career-wise never really made sense for me, you know, especially someone with quantitative skills to, to do that. But what I love about that time of my career is just, it's just your job to talk to interesting people and figure out their story. Because everyone has a good story. Not everyone knows what their story is and why it's interesting, but everyone has something in there. And I just take a lot of pleasure in drawing that out and figuring out what it is. And then, you know, you learn something new about their perspective. Certainly, you know, it's very easy to get into your bubble and to have most of the people in your social world and your family world have very similar education backgrounds, um, experiences traveling that you've had. But uh, I found certainly when I was traveling doing the book, you know, you met people with just, just couldn't have had more different experiences than I did. Certainly a, a lot less the privileges I've had yet, you know, had just obviously just so much to teach me. And, um, you know, really, I, I definitely learned a lot from them much more than they probably had to learn from me. 
We're, we're coming up on time, but I was wondering if, if uh, either or both of you had uh, anything hopeful that, that you can uh, leave us with during this, this time of uh, uncertainty and plague and, and conflict. You wanna go first? You, you can go ahead. Um, I, so, I mean, you know, I actually think there's a lot to be hopeful about. I mean, you know, everything is awful right now. The, the economy is bad. We have this once in a century pandemic. Uh, our political system seems really broken. Um, but, uh, you know, taking a, a, a slightly longer view, our political institutions are behaving marvelously right now. Uh, by every indication, all the votes are going to be counted. There's going to be a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, the Constitution will have will have survived and 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 will have and will have guided us through this. Um, and that's still an amazing thing. Uh, that's still an amazing thing. Um, uh, the recession has been bad, and there's a great deal of hardship. You know, at this point, I think it's reasonable to um, predict that uh, the, the pandemic recession will have been shorter and less severe than the Great Recession, uh, which began in 2008. Um, and, uh, you know, again, as I talk about in my book, if you, if you take an even longer view, um, all the evidence from the past several decades suggests that typical workers and typical households will uh, meet this challenge and, and, and overcome this obstacle. Um, a, a pandemic like the one we are experiencing, I think in previous times, would have been much more devastating to health and to life than uh, COVID-19 will be. And COVID-19 will be stopped in its tracks after about a year, thanks to uh, innovation and technology, and uh, and our our great pharmaceutical companies, uh, already uh, the mortality rate from COVID nineteen has plummeted, uh, thanks to innovation and in in therapeutics and in in, in, in treatment protocols, um, and all signs suggest that we're going to have a vaccine you know, maybe this month, maybe next month, that will be in wide circulation um, uh, by the coming spring or summer. Uh, and so, you know, I think, I think there's, there's a lot to be hopeful about and a lot to be optimistic about. Um, uh, and, um, you know, easier said than done to be hopeful and optimistic, but if you're trying, those are, those are, some, those are some, some arguments. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be hopeful for too. I think one of the impacts of this pandemic is a lot of technology that was out there we hadn't fully utilized is getting utilized. If you think about those QR codes, we're all using them now. So uh, I heard an interview with Nick Bloom where he, they were puzzling why we're having all this innovation but haven't had big increases in productivity. And he argued that we hadn't really like you know, the steam engine, you know, which was the most important innovation in the industrial era, it took 150 years to show up in productivity statistics and really move the economy. But now we've had this shock that has forced us to use all this technology that maybe wasn't showing up before. And now we will. So I think there's a good chance that there's going to be a bit of a messy transition getting out of it. The economy might be bad for another year, maybe not. But I think we're really going to see a productivity boost from this. Also, another thing that makes me hopeful. I never fully bought it, but there was always a narrative, particularly with young college students, that they were so fragile and like couldn't take disappointment. And they've certainly weathered. I feel so bad for people, young people now. They've definitely had a lot of disappointments and missed out on a lot of really important milestones. I mean, college isn't that long and it's a special time in your life. And they missed out on like a rather large fraction of it. So I'm really now really optimistic about this generation of high school and college students who I think are just going to be so much more resilient and tough and creative and innovative more than uh, we've seen in the last couple of decades. And another reason to be optimistic is their optimism. Yeah. You know, I just saw a, uh, a poll of millennials. And I don't remember the, the generation 
after them. I don't remember the name of it. Gen Z or is that? Gen Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Millennials and Gen Z. And uh, and they're, they're I think, uh, accurately optimistic. About- they've adapted and they've been like, I said, like, I feel like they're bearing the brunt of this more than anyone in terms of what they've had to miss out on in terms of how important socialization is at that age. Yet they're like, so positive and really have made this work for themselves. And I think a way that really bodes well for their economic future. Allison's book is An Economist Walks Into a Brothel. Michael's book is The American Dream is Not Dead. They're both available for purchase via a link on this screen. Thanksgiving's approaching. It may be a Zoom Thanksgiving or an in-person Thanksgiving. If you'd like your political conversations to be rational, and productive and nuanced. These books are a great way to prepare. Alison Schrager and Michael Strain, thanks so much. It's been very fun. Thank you. Thank you.